He happened to be building a palace when the news came, and he left all the bricks kicking about the floor for Nurse to clear up. But then the news was rather remarkable news. You see, there was a knock at the front door and voices talking downstairs, and Lionel thought it was the man come to see about the gas, which had not been allowed to be lighted since the day when Lionel made a swing by tying his skipping rope to the gas bracket. And then, quite suddenly, Nurse came in and said, Master Lionel, dear, they've come to fetch you to go and be king. Then she made haste to change his smock and to wash his face and hands and brush his hair, and all the time she was doing it, Lionel kept wriggling and fidgeting and saying, Oh, don't, nurse, and I'm sure my ears are quite clean, or never mind my hair, it's all right, and that'll do. You're going on as if you were going to be an eel instead of a king, said nurse. The minute Nurse let go for a moment, Lionel bolted off without waiting for his clean handkerchief, and in the drawing room there were two very grave-looking gentlemen in red robes with fur, and gold coronets with velvet sticking up out of the middle like the cream in very expensive jam tarts. They bowed low to Lionel, and the gravest one said, Sire? Your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather, the king of this country, is dead, and now you have to come and be king. Yes, please, said Lionel. When does it begin? You will be crowned this afternoon, said the grave gentleman, who was not quite so grave-looking as the other. Would you like me to bring nurse, or what time would you like me to be fetched? And hadn't I better put on my velvet suit with my lace collar? said Lionel, who had often been out to tea. Your nurse will be removed to the palace later. Now, never mind about changing your suit. The royal robes will cover all that up. The grave gentleman led the way to a coach with eight white horses, which was drawn up in front of the house where Lionel lived. It was number seven, on the left-hand side of the street, as you go up. Lionel ran upstairs at the last minute, and he kissed Nurse and said, Thank you for washing me. I wish I'd let you do the other ear, but no, there's no time now. Give me my hanky. Goodbye, Nurse. Goodbye, Ducky, said the Nurse. Be a good little king now. Say please and thank you, and remember to pass the cakes to the little girls, and don't have more than two helpings of anything. So off went Lionel to be made a king. He had never expected to be a king, any more than you have. So it was all quite new to him, so new that he had never even thought of it. And as the coach went through the town, he had to bite his tongue to be quite sure it was real, because if his tongue was real, it showed he wasn't dreaming. Half an hour before, he had been building with bricks in the nursery, and now the streets were fluttering with flags. Every window was crowded with people waving handkerchiefs and scattering flowers. There were scarlet soldiers everywhere along the pavement and all the bells of all the churches were ringing like mad, and like a great song to the music of their ringing, he heard thousands of people shouting, Long live Lionel! Long live our little king! He was a little sorry at first that he had not put on his best clothes, but he soon forgot to think about that. If he had been a girl, he would very likely have bothered about it the whole time. As they went along, the grave gentlemen, who were the Chancellor and the Prime Minister, explained the things that Lionel did not understand. I thought we were a republic, said Lionel. I'm sure there hasn't been a king for some time. Sire, your great-great-great-great-great-grandfather's death happened when my grandfather was a little boy, said the Prime Minister. 
And since then, your loyal people have been saving up to buy you a crown. So much a week, you know, according to people's means. Sixpence a week for those who have first-rate pocket money, down to half a penny a week for those who don't have as much. You know, it's the rule that the crown must be paid for by the people. But hadn't my great-great, however much it is, grandfather, a crown? Yes, but he sent it to be tinned over for fear of vanity. And he had had all the jewels taken out, and he sold them to buy books. He was a strange man. A very good king he was, but he had his faults. He was fond of books. Almost with his last breath he sent the crown to be tinned, and he never lived to pay the tinsmith's bill. Here the Prime Minister wiped away a tear, and just then the carriage stopped and Lionel was taken out of the carriage to be crowned. Being crowned is much more tiring work than you would suppose, and by the time it was over Lionel had worn the royal robes for an hour or two and he had had his hand kissed by everyone whose business it was to do it, and he was quite worn out and was very glad to get to the palace nursery. Nurse was there, tea was ready, seedy cake and plummy cake and jam and hot buttered toast and the prettiest china with red and gold and blue flowers on it and real tea and as many cups of it as you liked. After tea, Lionel said, I think I should like a book. Will you get me one, nurse? Ah, bless the child, said nurse. You don't suppose you've lost the use of your legs with becoming a king, do you? Run along and get the books yourself. So Lionel went down into the library. The prime minister and the chancellor were there, and when Lionel came in, they bowed very low and were beginning to ask Lionel most politely what on earth he was coming bothering them for, when Lionel cried out, Oh, what a world full of books! Are they yours? They are yours, your majesty, answered the chancellor. They were the property of the late king, your great, great, oh yes, yes, I know. Lionel interrupted. Well, I shall read them all. I love to read. I am so glad I learned to read. If I might venture to advise your majesty, said the prime minister, I should not read these books. Your great... Yes, said Lionel quickly. He was a very good king, Oh, yes, really a very superior king in his ways, but he was a little, well, strange. Was he mad? asked Lionel cheerfully. No, no, both the gentlemen were sincerely shocked. Not mad, but, if I may express it so, he was, um, too clever by half and I should not like a little king of mine to have anything to do with his books. Lionel looked puzzled. The fact is, the Chancellor went on, twisting his red beard in an agitated way, your great go on, said Lionel, was called a wizard. But he wasn't? Of course not. A most worthy king was your great, I see, but I wouldn't touch his books. Just this one, cried Lionel, laying his hands on the cover of a great brown book that lay on the study table. It had a gold pattern on brown leather and gold clasps with turquoises and rubies in the twists of them and gold corners so the leather should not wear out too quickly. I must look at this one, Lionel said, for on the back, in big letters, he read, The Book of Beasts. The Chancellor said, Don't be a silly little king. 
But Lionel had the gold clasps on done, and he opened the first page, and there was a beautiful butterfly all red and brown and yellow and blue, so beautifully painted that it looked as if it were alive. There, said Lionel, isn't that lovely? Why, but as he spoke, the beautiful butterfly fluttered its many-colored wings on the yellow page of the book and flew up and out the window. Well, said the Prime Minister, as soon as he could speak for the lump of wonder that had got into his throat and tried to choke him. That's magic, that is. But before he had spoken, the king had turned the next page, and there was a shiny bird, complete and beautiful in every blue feather. Under him was written, Blue Bird of Paradise. And while the king gazed enchanted at the charming picture, the blue bird fluttered his wings on the yellow page and spread them and flew out of the book. Then the prime minister snatched the book away from the king and shut it up on the blank page where the bird had been. He put it up on a very high shelf. And the chancellor gave the king a good shaking and said, You are a naughty, disobedient little king. And he was very angry indeed. Well, I don't see that I've done any harm, said Lionel. He hated being shaken, as all boys do. He would much rather have been slapped. No harm, said the Chancellor. Ah, uh, but what do you know about it? That's the question. How do you know what might have been on the next page? A snake, or a worm, or a centipede, or a revolutionist, or something like that. Oh, I'm sorry if I vexed you, said Lionel. Come, let's kiss and be friends. So he kissed the Prime Minister, and they settled down for a nice, quiet game of knots and crosses, while the Chancellor went to add up his accounts. But when Lionel was in bed, he could not sleep for thinking of the book, and when the full moon was shining with all her might and light, he got up and crept down to the library, and climbed up and got the Book of Beast. He took it outside to the terrace, where the moonlight was as bright as day, and he opened the book, and he saw the empty pages with Butterfly and Blue Bird of Paradise underneath, and then he turned to the next page. There was some sort of red thing sitting under a palm tree. Under it was written Dragon. The dragon did not move, and the king shut the book rather quickly and went back to bed. But the next day he wanted another look, so he took the book out into the garden, and when he undid the clasps with the rubies and the turquoises, the book opened all by itself at the picture with dragon underneath, and the sun shone full upon the page. And then, quite suddenly, a great red dragon came out of the book and spread its vast scarlet wings and flew away across the garden to the far hills, and Lionel was left with the empty page before him, for the page was quite empty, except for the green palm tree and the yellow desert, and the little streaks of red where the paintbrush had gone outside the pencil outlined of the red dragon. And then Lionel felt that he had indeed done it. He had not been king twenty-four hours, and already he had let loose a red dragon to worry his faithful subjects' lives. And they had been saving up for so long to buy him a crown and everything. Lionel began to cry. The Chancellor and the Prime Minister and the Nurse all came running to see what was the matter. And when they saw the book, they understood. And the Chancellor said, You naughty little king! Put him to bed, nurse. Let him think over what it is that he has done. Perhaps, my lord, said the Prime Minister, first we had better find out just exactly what he has done. Then Lionel, in floods of tears, said, 
It's a red dragon, and it's gone flying away to the hills, and I'm so sorry, and oh, do please forgive me. But the Prime Minister and the Chancellor had other things to think of than forgiving Lionel. They hurried off to consult the police and to see what could be done. Everyone did what they could. They sat on committees and stood on guard and lay in wait for the dragon, but he stayed up in the hills, and there was nothing more that could be done. The faithful nurse, meanwhile, did not neglect her duty. Perhaps she did more than anyone else, for she slapped the king and put him to bed without tea, and when it got dark, she would not give him a candle to read by. You are a naughty little king, she said, and your public will not love you.